Well, hello, and thank you to uh, today's webinar with Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Matthew Monagal. I'm the web manager here at CBS. And just a few quick notes for you before we get started. Um, we have about 40 minutes worth of speaking today. Our guests will be talking for about 30, 40 minutes. And then we've made sure to leave some time at the end, about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So as you're going through and listening, if things come to mind, you'll notice that there's a little box at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. Please feel free to drop your questions in there, and we will make sure that we keep an eye out for them and ask them at the end. So today's guest uh, is Professor Adam Galinsky. He's a professor at the Columbia Business School here at Columbia University. He has published over 150 scientific articles, chapters, and teaching cases in the fields of management and social psychology. His research and insights have appeared at The Economist, The New York Times, The New Yorker, NPR, Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, as well as several other publications. And he's here today to talk about his new book that he co-wrote with Marie Schweitzer of Wharton. And it is Friend and Foe, which has been getting rave reviews not only from The New York Times, The Economist, and The Financial Times, but also Oprah. This is, a, this is an Oprah pick. So uh, Professor Galinsky, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Is, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, and let's get started. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and to share some new insights that uh, me and my co-author have been working on. Um, I want to start off with a little story about a particular sale at Walmart in uh, 2008. And as you can see in this picture, uh, the crowd really gathered at this Walmart. Um, the store was going to open at 5 in the morning, and the uh, crowd gathered like uh, 3,000 people uh, were gathered by 3 a.m. The police were called in to try to contain the crowd, but they were ineffective. Eventually, the crowd started chanting, um, tear the doors down, um, and they unleashed their furry at some point and, and literally tore the hinges off uh, the, 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 um, the doors. And I wanted to think for a second about like what drove this frenzy, this crowd, and it turned out it was scarcity. What Walmart was doing is they were having a very special sale where there's only a few items that were incredibly, like 80% off, and people wanted those scarce items. Now, they, the, the Walmart employees tried to contain the crowd. They formed a human shield, um, but they never had a chance. Uh, many of them escaped onto shelves, but not poor Mr. Dumar, who was trampled by the crowd and passed away. What also makes this story so poignant is, is that it occurred on Thanksgiving Day. Um, we now think of Thanksgiving as one of the most cooperative days of the year. In fact, its origins came out of a cooperative, moving competitive impulses between Native Americans and settlers to cooperation. Um, but quickly, Thanksgiving turns into competition because we have something called Black Friday. Now, black is meant to signify profits on this particular day, um, but clearly at the Walmart case, it took on a darker meaning. And so we can see how easily we can go from competition cooperation and also from cooperation competition. I want to tell you, um, this isn't just about uh, this year, 2008. It's about every year. This is from 2013 Huffington Post on Black Friday, holiday spirits, shootings, stabbings, and brawls. Now, I want to tell you about another example of moving people from one of the most extreme cases of competition to cooperation very quickly. And I want you to think for a second about what nation has incredibly high trust towards the United States. In fact, more than 70% of this nation's citizens trust the United States. I think it's actually more than the number of US citizens trust the United States. I want you to think about that for a second. It turns out that country is Japan. And this is remarkable if we go back and look at our recent history of them. In 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. In over the next years, the Americans did an unbelievable aerial assault on Japan, including dropping 63 firebombs and doing the only two nuclear bombs that have ever been used as an act of attack. Yet, by 1951, they'd already formed cooperative business ventures, and by 1960, they had a mutual peace agreement. How did they go from 1945, extreme competition, to 1960? Well, part of it was what General MacArthur did, who took over the transition. He set up some simple rules. First of all, you couldn't strike any Japanese person if you were an American soldier. That's not very surprising. Um, what he also said is, look, American soldiers can only eat American rations. You're not allowed to eat any Japanese food. Um, and they invested in the economy. So we could see how quickly people can go from cooperation to competition. Now, the key insight of our book is that in every relationship we have, is characterized by tension between cooperation and competition. Let's take new parents. They cooperate 
to raise this infant child, yet at 3 o'clock in the morning, they compete fiercely over who gets to sleep and who has to get up. We see this also growing up with siblings. We have brotherly and sibling love, but we also have sibling rivalry. And no one knows about the competition, tension between cooperation competition, better than twins. In fact, for twins, this tension begins in the womb. Um, I'm a twin myself, and my brother actually won this battle with me. He came out of the womb 50% larger than I was. Um, and, and we'll come back to twins in a minute. And of course, this occurs at work. We collaborate on projects, and yet we compete over promotions and raises. So the key insight of the book is that we are cooperating, competing all the time, often at the same time with the same people. And so to be successful, what we need to do is we need to find the right balance between these forces. So if we cooperate too much, we can be exploited. If we compete too much, we can prevent the possibility of creating new value and expanding the pie. So our goal in life is in all of our relationships to find the right balance between cooperation and competition. Now I want to give you a little insight into three of the chapters of the book. Um, I want to tell you about two twins. They were separated at birth, raised in completely different cities. One of them was raised as a Buddhist, the other as a Christian. And they met each other in their 40s after never having interacted with each other. And one of them said, you know, one brother said to the other, so hey, what, what do you do for a living? He's like, I own a bodybuilding gym. And the other one said, hey, what do you do? He's like, I own a bodybuilding gym. These two twins who were separate at birth um, had become remarkably similar. And there's a curious finding, which is that sometimes twins reared apart are often more alike than twins reared together. And the question is, why would that be the case? And we'll come back and solve that puzzle in a minute. Now, one of the things that's true about the world is that we are inevitable, continuous, and constant comparison makers. Now, I want to ask you a question to understand this is, how well are you doing at work? How are your kids doing? How nice is your car? It's almost impossible to answer those questions without making some type of comparison. My car is really nice because it's better than X, or I'm making good money compared to Y. Now, these comparisons not only are inevitable, but they can also inspire us and also make us miserable. Now, let me show you a quote of someone who's inspired by a particular comparison, a rivalry they had, and that's Larry Bird. He has this great quote, the first thing I would do every morning was look at the box score to see what Magic Johnson did. I didn't care about anything else. So his rivalry, his comparison with Magic Johnson drove his behavior. So comparisons are good. They increase motivation and performance. But they can also be bad. In one second, I'm going to show you a little video. And in this video, you're going to see a monkey get a cucumber. He's going to be very happy with this. He's going to give a, a little pebble to get the cucumber. And you could do that all day long with this monkey, where he would just keep eating cucumbers. But watch what happens when he sees the monkey next to him get a grape. You can roll the video now. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. <laughs> and so what you can see in this video is that the, clearly the, the monkey is very happy in the cucumber until he sees another monkey get a grape. Um, and then he pretty much goes apeshit. Right? He throws the, the cucumber back, at, you know, shakes the cage in frustration. Um, and so we can see how um, that there's, there's bad in, 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 um, uh, in making these comparisons. Here's sort of a, um, they can increase resentment, they can increase spite, and they can increase unethical behavior. Um, one of my favorite examples of an ethical behavior is between British Airways and Virgin Atlantic. When Virgin Atlantic was coming on the scene, um, British Airways um, hacked into their system to try to um, see what their routes were and how they were doing and performing, and they engaged in, all, in a variety of unethical behaviors, including spreading rumors about Richard Branson. Um, a great example of spite is we just saw with this monkey where he throws it back, takes the cucumber and refuses to eat it. A Russian parable really captures this idea of spite too. Um, uh, a Russian man rubs a, a lamp and a genie comes out and says, I will give you one wish, but there's a catch. Your navel get double whatever you get. And the man paces back and forth and thinks about it for a little bit. 
then he says, I got it. I want you to poke out one of my eyes. He wants his neighbor to go blind. So we can see how these comparisons can really drive us. So we need to find the right balance because comparisons can be motivating. But they can create resentment. How do we create motivation with satisfaction? Well, I want to come back to that puzzle I gave you about twins being remarkably similar when they're reared apart. And one of the things that really defines our personality growing up when we have siblings is differentiation from them. We find ways to not compete with our siblings by finding other things that we're good at. I'm a twin myself, as I mentioned, and you know my twin brother was a better runner than I was. I, I ran pretty well. I ran a, a 10K in you know, about 46, 47 minutes when I was 12 years old, but my brother ran it in you know, two to three minutes faster than I did. And so very soon, I was no longer a runner. I was a wrestler. I differentiated myself from my brother in a way that we could both support each other, but without being overwhelmed by the competition. Now, one of the things that we often compare each other on is how much power do we have? And I want to tell you a little about power because I want you to think for a second, what is power? Now, most of you would say power is a structural variable. Power is control over important resources. I have power over someone when, they have, when I have resources they want. I have power over someone. I have authority to reward or punish people, um, et cetera. But one of the things that I've shown over the last two decades in my research is we've reconceived exactly what power is. Power isn't just something that exists as a structure. It also exists inside our heads. And what that means is that we can create a sense of power independent from the structural forms of power that we have. And the little technique that I created more than uh, 15 years ago was we brought people in, in and we just asked them to think about time when they had power to write down this experience. What we found is it actually had the same consequences, the same effects if we'd actually given someone power in the lab. I'm going to tell you a little story about one of my former students, Jillian Koo. Um, she gave a job talk at Harvard Business School, and a job talk for an academic is a pretty brutal affair. You go in for 90 minutes and you present your research, and their sole job is to just try to cut you down. They're just trying to tear you apart. And she really got hammered in this talk at HBS. A couple weeks later, she was going for a job talk at London Business School. And before her 90-minute talk, they gave her about a half an hour to prepare. And so she decided to do exactly what we had created in the lab. She wrote about an experience when she had power. That she went in this talk, and she was in complete control. She was in command, and she just hit the ball out of the park, got the job, and is now a tenured professor at LBS. So we decided, could we take this finding and actually test it directly? We took advantage of a unique situation in France where one of my co-authors had access to a number of people who were applying to business schools and were doing a mock business school interview. And what we did is um, we told the judges to just select about 50% of the people. Um, and the judges didn't know that an experiment was going on. So the judges were blind to the fact that anything else was happening. And then we had a third of the people do exactly what Jillian did. Think about time when they had power. We had a third of the people Think about time when they lacked power. See what will happen there. And then we had a third of the people that were in a baseline condition. And so I want to show you the data now, which I think are pretty remarkable. We can see in the baseline condition, the judges did exactly what was expected. About 50% of people were admitted. But look what happened in the low power condition. It plummets down below 30%. And in the high power condition, it rises and rises up to almost 70%. But Thinking about time and power, these people became more confident, more optimistic, and they did better. And so this is the good in power. It increases confidence and optimism. But there's bad in power. And to show this, I want us to do a little experiment. I want you all to raise your dominant hand and as quickly as possible draw a capital letter E on your forehead using your index finger. So just take a couple minutes to do this. Draw a capital letter E on your forehead using your index finger. Now, it turns out you can draw this E in one of two ways. One is the correct way. We call this the other focused E. The only reason why you want to draw an E on your forehead is so it looks like an E to someone else. But sometimes people draw what's called a self-focused E. It looks great to them, but it's backwards to other people. Well, we did a little experiment where we brought people into the laboratory, and we signed some people to a high power condition. And we said, you're going to control an important resource. You're going to decide how many lottery tickets you and another person get. Or he told someone and said, look, Someone else is going to decide what lottery tickets you get. They control an important resource you want. And then before they did a task together, we put everyone into a separate room and asked them to draw an E on their forehead. And look at the data. In the low power condition, 
almost 10% of people, only about 10% of people drew a self-focused state. But look what happened in the high power condition. It nearly tripled almost to 35%. Simply giving people power seemed to take away their perspective inability. So the bad in power is it reduces perspective taking. Now, how are you successful? How do we find the right balance between confidence without having self-focus so we get confidence in other focus? And to understand this, I want to give you a little metaphor of driving a car. Now, to get from point A to point B, you need gas. You need acceleration. And power is a psychological accelerator. But to get from point A to point B, we also need to a good steering wheel. Otherwise, we're going to crash into things along the way. So power is a psychological accelerator, but perspective taking is a psychological steering wheel. Now, to really appreciate this, I want to tell you um, one of the things that we need to do to be good perspective takers as powerful people is we need to recognize that when we have power, our behavior has bigger impact. So our whispers can sound like shouts. Our small Constructive criticism can come across like a bomb, as you can see in this picture. I want to tell you a little story about one of my uh, former PhD students that I worked with um, that really clarifies this. When I was a young assistant professor at the Kellogg School of Management, um, I had power over PhD doctoral students, but the full chaired professors had power over me because they would one day vote on my tenure. And one day I saw one of these less powerful people, a woman named Gail, and I said, hey, Gail. Can you come by my office this afternoon? I really need to talk to you. I didn't think much of it, and Gail came by at 3 o'clock. When she came in, she was kind of tentative and crouched down. And I told her what I wanted to talk to her about. It was so trivial, I can't remember it. And then Gail stood up and looked at me and said, never do that again. And I said, do what? She said, never say you need to tell me that you need to speak to me without telling me why. I spent the whole day stressed out, worried, fearful. Is he mad at me? Am I going to be punished? What's going on? Now, at first, I thought Gail was a little neurotic, maybe even a little crazy. And then what happened is the very next day, the chair of my department sent me an email that said, hey, Adam, can you come by my office? I really need to talk to you later. And then I walked into her office, and I was crouched down, and I was apprehensive, and I was tentative. So there are a couple lessons in this example and a couple broader lessons. First of all, we call this the power amplification effect. The key idea here is that our behavior gets amplified when we have power. Our criticism gets louder. Our gratitude has greater impact. And our ambiguity becomes deafening in its poignancy. So let's go back to Gail. What could I have done differently? Well, what I could have said to Gail was, hey, can you come by my office? something that's not important at all. Or, hey, can you come by my office and explain what it was because it was so trivial? Or, if it is important, to let them know that so they can prepare for that. Now, another key insight is this. Because our behavior gets amplified and we have power, we can use that constructively. What's one thing that we have in our arsenal that can have a huge impact on people? And that's our gratitude. When I was a young assistant professor, I took a class with a future uh, Nobel laureate. And in my first day of my first PhD class, I said a comment, and this person looked at me and derisively said, that's completely wrong. And as you can imagine, I just shrunk back into myself, and I was really you know, uh, impaired by that. And I noticed he did it to other people, so that made it a little bit better, but I still was wounded. But then a couple weeks later, the same professor came up to me um, in the hallway, pulled me aside, smiled at me, and said, I just want to let you know that you're a great writer. And I just skipped the rest of the day. I ran home to call my girlfriend and my parents and let them know um, that this person had thought I was a good writer. And so two things that we can do with the power. We can express gratitude and we can express praise. And when we do, especially when it's meaningful and well-deserved, it has a great impact. Now, the final story I want to tell you um, from the book is really the question of hierarchy. When we have high and low power people together, we have a social hierarchy. And the question is, is hierarchy good or bad? And to understand this, I want to tell you about an eventful day that happened in April of this year. One company gave all of their employees an opportunity to leave the company and get a nice severance package. Now, they do this every year, and usually about 2% of this company's um, employees quit. But on this particular day, 14% of this company quit. A shocking number. And the name of that company was Zappos. What they had done is they'd instituted a new 
management technique called holacracy, which was basically the opposite of hierarchy. Everyone's equal. But it led to chaos, confusion, and quitting. Google discovered this also. They came into being. They were engineers. Like, we're engineers. We don't need any freaking managers. It turned out all they got was chaos and confusion instead. So it turns out that a hierarchy can be very beneficial. And to understand that, I want to ask you a question. Would you rather play a game with your boss or your best friend? Now, most of us say, I want to play a game with my best friend. I love my best friend. But let me tell you about the rules of this game. There's three rules to tell you about. The first rule is this. There's two options. In one option, you get more lottery tickets and your partner gets fewer. In the other one, they get more um, and or they get more and you get fewer. Now, the two other rules are really important. The first is that there's no communication. And the second is you both only receive your lottery tickets if you both choose the same option. Now, imagine playing this game with your boss. It's really easy, right? I let my boss have option B, and they take option B because they think they deserve more. I think they deserve more. We both get lottery tickets. Now what happens when you play with your best friend? Well, maybe you think, I'm going to be generous. I love my best friend. But they're generous. Now you both pick different options, and you get a worse outcome. Or you say, I'm going to be selfish because my friend's going to be generous. But they think the same thing. And so what hierarchy allows us to do is it creates something called patterns of deference that produce cooperation coordination. Now, to understand this, I want to tell you a little study that we did with the fashion industry. What we did is we analyzed every fashion house over a 20-year period, or 20-season period, 11, seasons, 11 years. And we looked to see how creative each of these fashion houses were. Now, we didn't actually measure their creativity. There's this journal in France who asks buyers and journalists to rate the creativity of every fashion line that's presented every major fashion show in Milan, Paris, London, and New York. Now, we noticed something really curious in the data, that when the most important creative position, the highest executive position on the creative side, the creative director, when there were two creative directors, that is co-leaders, they had worse creativity than when there's a single leader. So there's a type of curse of co-leadership. Now, we can understand that going back to this game. right? Imagine two bosses playing that game. They both think that they deserve the better outcome. And therefore, it becomes takes away pounds of deference and becomes difficult to coordinate their behavior. So co-leadership can be a bad idea in many cases because it takes away the pecking order. Well, we also need coordination and a pecking order in tasks that require a lot of cooperation and coordination. And here's one sport that does, and that's basketball. And I want to tell you a little story about something that happened back in July of 2010. A man named LeBron James decided to take his talents to South Beach. And on the day of their celebration, they had this big announcement. They said, it's Wade's house. It's LeBron's kingdom, and it's Bosch's pit. But notice that it couldn't be all three. Sports writers were all over the case, writing things like, until there's a pecking order, there won't be any success. Until they figure out who gets the ball, they won't be any order. And it turns out these sports writers were right. In the first season together, they were horrible in close games, when you need the most cooperation and you need the most coordination. 29 out of 30 teams, that's how good they were in that, and in, in, that's how bad they were in close games, and they lost the NBA championship. Now, what happened the next year? Well, the next year, Dwayne Wade injured his knee, became 30% of Dwayne Wade, and they solved the dueling banjos problem, the co-leadership problem, and they ended up winning the championship the next two years. Now, we wanted to see if this idea of getting too much talent on one team could be problematic. So we took 10 years of NBA basketball data. We looked at the amount of talent on each team and the amount of performance. And what you can see here is something really clear, that as the number of top talent increases, performance goes up, but only up to a point. And then performance declines over time. And so you can see is that there's this negative slope. Now, I want you all to think about why this might be the case. How could we get evidence that it's really something about coordination? Well, it turns out we measured something which is called assist. And assist went down when teams had too much talent. Now I want you to think about a team sport that doesn't need to coordinate its behavior. Well, we might not find too much talent, but maybe we always want more talent. Well, it turns out that sport is baseball. And there's a famous sports writer named Bill Simmons who had this great quote who said, baseball is an individual sport masquerading as a team sport. 
So we took the same 10 years of data from the MBA and look what we found. We only found a more talent is better. So when we put these together, we can see a very clear pattern. In basketball, which is an interdependent task that requires coordination and cooperation, we can get a too much talent effect. In baseball, which doesn't require a lot of coordination, we can get a never enough talent effect. So we can start to see this problem. So that's the good in, in, in hierarchy. It helps us perform more effectively and corner our behavior. But I wanted you to think about situations where hierarchy is bad. When I ask this question around the world, people immediately come up to two ideas. One is innovation. And what they're really talking about is expression of ideas. That what happens in hierarchies, low power people don't feel comfortable expressing their ideas. Let me tell you a little study we did. We took every expedition that went up the Himalayas over 100 years. And we analyzed what country that expedition came from. And we found if countries came, uh, the expedition came from countries where they were more hierarchical, they were more likely to have people die on the mountain. Now, presumably, it's because they didn't feel comfortable speaking up, the lower power people challenging the hierarchy. We have direct evidence that's the case from hospitals. In surgery, one of the things that doctors are trying to avoid is mainline infections. If an infection gets in the main line, a patient could be toast. And what they discovered was the best predictor of mainline infections was doctors skipping important checklist items. What they also found is the nurses didn't feel comfortable speaking up and challenging the nurses, and so what, or challenging the doctors. And because the nurses didn't feel comfortable speaking up, it led to disasters. So the bad in hierarchies is it silences low power perspectives, which can lead to disasters. So we need coordination but we get silence of low power with hierarchy. How do we get hierarchy to have coordination with all voices being heard? I'm going to give you three powerful techniques. Well, first of all, what did Johns Hopkins do to solve this problem? What they did is, is that they put nurses in charge of the checklist. That is, they gave some authority to low power people, and it reduced the number of mainline infections. Now, another thing you can do is don't collect information publicly. When we collect information publicly, the low power people feel compelled to just concur and conform to the high power people. So if you collect information privately, you can get the benefits of hierarchy without these dying signs. And there's a number of wonderful apps out there, including the Candor app. Um, and then finally, I want to tell you a story about the TV show, The Shield. The producer noticed that some of the women during the um, pitch meetings didn't feel comfortable sharing their story ideas didn't participate very much. And somebody wanted to be a good producer. He said, I want you to participate. And they laughed in his face. They laughed in his face. And he said, why? He said, watch what happens when we do participate. And what he noticed is they always got interrupted. People would take over their ideas. The men would actually run with them or shut them down. And so he instituted a new rule called the no interruption rule. And it said two positive benefits. The first thing that it did is it allowed the women to have more opportunity to speak up. The second thing it did is it made everyone's ideas better. They were all more comfortable speaking up. So there's two key insights in this book. The first is that we are friend and foes with everyone. We're constantly cooperating and competing. We're oscillating back and forth between cooperation and competition, back and forth. And sometimes we're cooperating and competing in the same relationship at the same time. The second big insight is this. If you become aware of this and recognize this, it makes all of your relationships better. You connect to people more successfully. You compete when you need to, cooperate when you need to, and you find the right balance. I'll just give you one example. I just got married four weeks ago, and uh, we had a very uh, relatively quick wet wedding, partially because the book was coming out. We wanted to get married before it did. And so we, we had only six weeks to plan our wedding. And there was some tension early on. We were kind of competing with each other. But just having written this book and sort of being aware about this tension, I was able to take a step back and sort of think about how can we cooperate. The wedding is one of the most cooperative things ever without getting in these competitive battles and tensions. And just being aware of that can make us more successful. Now, I want to tell you three final quick little nuggets from the book, and then happy to answer any questions um, that you have. Um, we talk about a lot of different topics. So one topic we talk about extends what I just talked to you about power, which is about um, hierarchy and gender. And there's a couple key insights in the book, which I think you'll all find ex interesting. The first is, is that power affects women very much in the same way that it affects men. 
if women ruled the world, it wouldn't look that much different. However, because women have less power in society, they are boxed in by prescriptive stereotypes that say that they need to be communal, and that puts a constraint on them acting with power. Now, we talk about how to solve this problem, how to act with power, how to lean in without getting pushed back in a number of different ways. Um, and uh, Cheryl Sandberg read multiple drafts of this chapter and was really helpful in that process. Um, two other quick ideas. One is that we talk a lot about how to get people to trust you quickly. But how can you detect when other people are deceiving you? And when we slip away, how are we able to come together and put the pieces back together? How do we know when and how to apologize? And then finally, we talk a lot about when do you start your engines? Do you want to be the first one interviewed or the last one interviewed? Do you want to be the first one to make an offer negotiation or later? Do you want to be on the top of the ballot or the bottom of the ballot? Um, and so I hope that you guys all found this um, interesting. Happy to answer questions. I um, hope that you uh, are inspired to go buy the book. Um, and please um, answer questions now or reach out with any other um, uh, thoughts over email. As you can see, my email and, and Twitter are right there. So happy to answer questions now. Hi, Adam. Uh, thank you so much. I think that was really great. And I, I can tell you were a big hit with our audience by the number of congratulations on your wedding that have rolled in. So we've had uh, more than a few people even in the comment section. Congratulations. So again, oh, congratulations. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I've got a, a few questions here that I'm going to ask. And, and now is the time. If you have anything that you'd like to, to know, you feel free to leave a, something in the Q&A, and we'll try and get to it. The first one that I saw actually was uh, we had someone who is the new mother of fraternal twins that was listening, okay. and she just wanted to know if the uh, the insights that you had into twins, if they apply only to identicals or if they also apply to fraternal. I think this might be a question for the next 18 years or so. Yes, well, I'm a fraternal twin myself, so I can answer that very well. So, I mean, I think the key insight is that, um, you know, it's any times, the key thing about comparisons is that we compare with people that are the most similar to us and you know, the most proximate to us. And so siblings will compare themselves in general. The closer they are in age, the more likely they are to compare to each other and feel competitive feelings. And so twins who are born at the same time are the most likely to do that. I think that one of the things that parents can do is really to encourage twins to find their own sort of um, identity in a sense and, and to find their own interest as a way to solve that competition cooperation um, paradox, but at the same time not dissuade them from having the same interest if they want to. And so it's a partly just being aware of this and helping them find the right path and helping them find the right balance. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question here, uh, which I, I, I'm curious to know. It's about when you have the power in the relationship. How do you know, especially if you're dealing with someone who is more of a peer, how do you know when you are the most powerful one in that relationship? Well, I, I think you know, it's very, you know, peers are very complicated in, in the sense of um, knowing power. And I think that one of the things that we often lose sight of at work is we think, oh, this is my peer, we're cooperating. And then you find out suddenly that well, maybe they're also competing with you. And so part of it is to recognize that there's a complex relationship with peers between cooperation and competition. Now, power is an important variable um, in those relationships. And we often see, I see many times where two people were best friends, um, one of them gets promoted and now has some power over the other, and it really complicates the relationship. Because, wait, is he my best friend or is she my boss, right? What, which is this person? And so I think it's, again, being aware of those processes and being aware of that tension and being trying to try to diagnose it um, makes it more effective. Now, to answer the question, who has more power in any relationship, I think it comes down to a couple different things. One is, does one person control more of an important resource than the other person? And does the other person have better alternatives than the other person? And if I have better alternatives and I control more important resources, then I'm going to have more power in a relationship. Now, regarding the NBA example that you used, we had one person ask if there is perhaps an ideal number of people for a high-performing team. Um, I guess speaking to a little bit about diminishing returns, but yep. is there a sweet spot for for how many maybe in a management team you should have? Yeah, I mean that's complicated. You know, so there's another great study that basically has the same findings we do, not with basketball, but with um, Wall Street. Um, uh, sell side researchers, and what they found is when they had too many stars in a group above about 65%, then it actually started to turn negative. Um, and that was just one example. We haven't found a precise number. I think it's just, again, being aware that if we get too many stars in a group, they'll start spending more of their time 
competing with each other rather than cooperating. And one of my, you know, we talk about pecking orders. One of my favorite studies that we talk about in the book is um, where a lot of these ideas come from is from chickens. And a, and a famous study done in 1965 with poultry scientists, they noticed something really interesting is that they took high egg performing chickens and bred them in order to try to increase the number of eggs they could produce, and egg production actually went down. Well, how do we explain this? Well, it turned out the high egg producing uh, chickens were also the most competitive chickens, and they were getting these fights and they would kill each other. And so what they learned is that you could either have high egg performing chickens who are caged in isolation, but if they were in a group together, if you got too many competitive chickens together, it went down. And so it's just being aware of those competitive dynamics are really important. Now our next question asks about specifically creative industries such as screenwriting or fashion design. Um, yep. Is there any place where a hierarchy might be counterproductive and where you might want to think about having these kind of equal teams across the board? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, for example, there's a lot of data that um, for innovation and creative ideas, hierarchy tends to have a negative effect. Um, and so there's a lot of evidence, for example, of trying to reduce that. <clears throat> One of my favorite examples is IDEO, um, which is a product design firm which is known for being very creative. And what they do is during the idea generation stage, they kind of eliminate the hierarchy. They don't really have a leader. They just have a facilitator. They have some important rules, like no one can criticize any idea. And they, they really sort of diminish the hierarchy there. However, once an idea is selected and they have to implement it, it's kind of like the army. Now we need a general who's barking out the orders and telling people what they need to do because coordination is really required. And so it really comes down to, are we trying to like integrate ideas and build off each other's ideas? Then we want to diminish hierarchy, but when we want to you know, physically connect our behaviors, hierarchy can actually be a pretty effective strategy. Great, thank you. So our next question is about the language that we use when we describe these things. Uh, competition can sometimes have an aggressive uh, mm -hmm. feeling to it. Are there other phrases or other ways we should talk about competition and cooperation in our organizations to get the desired results? Well, I think one of the things to do is just to, you know, when I say that they recognize this, there's this tension between cooperation and competition, is just to recognize that we sometimes um, have you know, competitive feelings towards each other, and being aware of that is really important. Now, is there a better word than competition? Um, I, I think, I, I don't, I can't think of a better word other, I mean, we, we have other words for cooperation, like collaboration, but I think the idea is really that, you know, you could call it self-interested behavior, um, or not working with others and towards the group goal. Um, so I, I think that those are those are a couple of, of, of those things. But again, awareness that this is always present is going to make you more constructive. You're going to have better outcomes and better relationships. I think the, the MBA example you used is a popular one. We've got a, a couple of questions in here sure. on that. So if stars are limited, then, then how do you kind of focus and develop new stars within your organization? Right. So I mean, so one of the things that's really interested is that there's also a, um, people instinctively understand this idea that there's an order that's natural for people to go in. So for example, George W. Bush ran for president before his younger brother, even though some people thought his younger brother might be a better candidate back in 2000. <clears throat> the, Venus Williams was the favorite v Williams sister before Serena, um, sorry, just getting a sip of water. <clears throat> before Serena um, got involved, uh, you know, and became the, the better sister. And so there's a sense of going in order. So with young stars, you want to bring them in, but also have them recognize that they need to, um, in a sense, sort of rise up um, along, along the path that other people have risen up. And that's one way to reduce the tension between young stars and old stars. And there's some great case studies of like um, NHL teams and trying to find the rat, right balance between the young stars and the old stars to, to be successful. Um, and I think, you know, great coaches are able to, to find that balance. So I think what you want to do with the young stars is encourage them, but also help them understand that getting into too quick of a status contest with the older stars is going to only hurt the group and maybe even ultimately hurt their careers. Now, I know we have a, a few Yankees fans in here because they were talking specifically about the Yankees, but um, what do you do necessarily when the, you have a team that has some of the best players, the best stars, but the results aren't there? I think it's complicated. I think, you know, in baseball, the data are very clear that basically more talent is always better. Um, I think, you know, when you say, well, the Yankees haven't done as good a job in the last few years as they did back in the early 2000s, they have less talent than they did back in the early 2000s. And I think that's one of the, the biggest differences between those. It turns out, if, you, if you're interested in leadership, that um, the coach matters a lot in basketball. 
managers don't matter that much in baseball. Um, in fact, some analysis suggests that only four or five managers have ever exceeded their talent level in the history of baseball, whereas you see many coaches exceeding their talent level um, in basketball and making a big difference. And so I think, you know, in a sport like baseball, you really want talent. Now, sometimes you can get that working really hard. The, the four core Yankee fans know, you know, back with Andy Pettit and Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera and Posada. Um, sometimes you try to get some high-priced, um, uh, you, know, you get some high-priced um, free agents uh, like Randy Johnson or, or, or A-Rod. But in, you know, in, in that type of sport, it's, more talent is better. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for just two more questions. So here's one I think that is an interesting example of when you've kind of committed to a course of action and you need to make it work. We have someone who says that their executive team of eight is about to abandon the offices and sit together in a single room at a single long table. What can they do to make this, um, to make the power dynamic at this table kind of work? If you're committed to a course of action, how do you make the power interplay work out for everyone involved? Well, just one of the things to recognize is that there's always going to be some status hierarchy that merges in every group. And so if you're going to all go into a room of eight people sitting around a table, you've got to think a little carefully about where's everyone going to sit? Are you going to do first come, first serve? Are we going to decide where some people sit? Are some people higher status so they should sit at the end of the table? Um, so I think you know, these questions become really important because they create strong feelings. Someone who feels they deserve to be at the end of the table is then going to feel frustrated that comparison. They're going to feel like the monkey with the cucumber, potentially. And so you know, going to that, just as like it's a big battle, what office you get, what seat you get if you're all sitting around the table can make a huge difference um, in how people interact. And so I think just being aware of that again and not just doing it without thinking about it can prevent some of these hurt feelings and status conflicts from occurring. Now, I know from our perspective, we always enjoy having you join us for our advanced management program. You always do a, a session in there every year. So kind of jumping off of that, um, what do you, how do you change or address issues of power when you're sitting at a table with the highest level of people, you specifically, when you're, when you're talking about how best to think about power, friends and foes, um, and you're talking to senior executives, leaders of organizations, CEOs, and things like that, um, what is the message there to them to make sure that every level of their organization is successful? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of the things we also have to recognize is that, you know, you can act with more power than you have, but only up to a point. So imagine being, you know, one of the things that I do in this AMP program and the Advanced Management program is I, I talk about how um, a lone person can shift a group in another direction. And, but they have to start out not too forcefully, because that's going to make people just push them away or use their power. And so I show a video where we can see how one person who doesn't really have a lot of power in the group um, starts to get leveraged by asking questions. Just come across as someone who's curious. I, I'm just, I just want to know a little bit more about this. And so you could call that low power speak. But what it does is allows people to start getting inferences into their own mind. Um, another thing to do is if you have a really good idea, maybe articulate that to a higher power person before going into the meeting, get them on board, and then they can articulate that, and then you can follow up with that. And so there's a variety of things to do, but if you walk in and just try to express your opinion without actually considering the power dynamics, you're bound to be crushed and to lose in the process. Well, Adam, thank you so much. I think that's just about all the time we have for today. Um, I just wanted to, to give, we had a, more than a few people who are very excited to read the book and are excited to buy a copy of it. So is there uh, a particular place you'd like them to go uh, to pick uh, up Amazon, a copy of Friend Info? Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, um, any bookseller, um, there, any place you can go. And if there's anyone that I didn't get a chance to answer your question, feel free to email me directly. Um, and I hope that you like the book as much as I do and that you can spread the word about it. Great. Well, thank you so much for everyone that's listening. Uh, we will be sending out a, a link to the full audio of this, um, and we'll also include the video if you want to be able to share that with your teams back home. Um, so keep an eye out in the next week or so. You'll, you'll get the URL for this as well. Thanks to everyone who attended. Special thank you again to Professor Adam Galinsky, um, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much.